Denise, are we good? A lot of rocking chair yet, Mark? Yes, we're good to go. Thank we're you. actually live streaming right now on YouTube. So please go ahead. Thank you. So good morning. Uh, this is the Township of North Dumfries Council meeting Monday, April 27th. This is done by teleconference video conferencing. Um, due to COVID-19 and recommendations by Water Region Public Health to exercise social distancing, the Township Administrative Office is closed to the public until May 4th, Monday, May 4th, 2020. Members of the public are invited to view this open meeting electronically by accessing the meeting stream on the tele, uh, Township's YouTube page uh, at, and it's www.youtube.com slash channel slash UC 2075 IN, and then uh, the text is there. Once on the Township's YouTube page, please select the video for the meeting that you wish to watch. Following the the close of the meeting, a recording of the meeting will be available on the township's website. While in-person uh, participation is not feasible at this time, members of the public are invited to submit written comments to Ashley Sage, the clerk, at asage at northdumfries.ca, which will be provided to the mayor and council prior to the meeting and will form part of the public record. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Can I please have approval of the agenda? Sure, so that motion is moved by Councillor Gillespie and seconded by Councillor Roloman. The Council adopt the April 27th, 2020 Council agenda as presented with the following addendums. Number one, add item 10.1, discussion regarding the July 1st Canada Day celebration in the township. And that Council adopt the amended agenda format for the scheduled meeting date and time that includes the combined committee of the whole regular council agenda format as, as outlined in section 7.6 of the procedural bylaw number 3130-20. Uh, Mayor Foxen, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Councillor, Os uh, sorry, Councillor Rollman. Yes. Councillor Osner. Yes. Councillor McCreary. Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. That motion has been carried. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none. Uh, public meetings. Uh, so we are at The Committee of a Whole recommendations items to be approved as presented as outlined in the staff reports listed in the finance function area. So are there any, uh, do you want to, is there any comments of regards to the financial report, uh, Ms. Stettel? Um, just an overview of the financial report. Um, is just an early indication as to what will happen uh, in the township based on some of the events that have happened to date. There are a number of events that are still continuing to evolve. So we anticipate that um, the changes will probably, um, will update this report and uh, the changes will probably make the forecast a little different than what we're seeing right now. Uh, and not only will there be an impact on the 2020 budget, but there is uh, uh, probably an impact on our long-term uh, financial forecast. Um, there's a number of items that are in this report and um, I know it's been posted and everybody's had a chance um, to you know, go through it. Uh, I have given some uh, in background information on what our cash flow looks like to date, but not projections. Um, again, based on the fact that it's a little bit early to know how, what might change. We have been doing some changes with electronic payments, making that more accessible for customers. Um, we've been working with our purchases and our vendors in order to try to uh, improve um, metho methodology so that we are not, we're having less contact, things are more electronic, but also to be conscious of um, what will happen once we come back with social distancing. Um, there's some discussion in about the impact of taxation changes. There's been a, um, some discussion, we've already, council's already approved that, but there's some other changes about our payment programs are being delayed. Uh, tax deferrals, property reassessments, and um, some uh, discussion on the relief programs that could potentially come back to council but are not being promoted at this time. More work is still being done and the area treasurers 
um, have been at the table weekly. We are talking to the municipalities, not only just in the region of Waterloo, but also in throughout the entire um, province of Ontario. I'm working with other uh, municipalities that are the same size as ours, trying to make sure that what, a program that we have is going to be consistent to all taxpayers. Um, so the preliminary results of this particular program, and I've given some other um, attachments to the report, uh, at this point in time, we are not anticipating a surplus or deficit. We actually, the net effect is it, at this point in time with the changes that we've seen, and this is calculating for things like the fact that we have lost revenue from facilities, um, interest on taxes, but we've also taken some other um, uh, progressive steps, taking the ice out early, um, and some other things that are listed in the report just to try and offset it. So between the, the, the positive uh, or the losses and the revenues, we've also mitigated with some savings on the cost. So that's what comes down to the, the net number. I was very pleased with the report. Council, if you had uh, used the raise hand to let me know if you want to speak. I see no, uh, Councillor Osner. Go ahead, Councillor Osner. Councillor Rolleman was first. Oh, I actually don't have him on the screen. Hang on, let me just get this. There we go, I apologize. Councillor Rolleman. Uh, thanks, and thanks, Derek. Um, my question is with regards to the COVID policies that we're gonna ask our vendors to start uh, submitting. Are we going to have a checklist or are we going to make vendors just make up their own list and then arbitrarily decide they're not in compliance? I think it's more fair to say that here's a checklist of things that we're looking for and that they have to meet those criteria as opposed to making businesses have to jump through all kinds of hoops that they have no idea what those hoops are going into the, into the bidding process. So, so Madam Mayor, if I could, I'll speak to that. Has, um, uh, I circulated moment, okay, to just a minute, please, please, Andrew. Um, Shelly, both Shelly and you, if you could use the raised hand and I'll call upon you one at a time. Uh, uh, so Shelly, you wanted to start and then we'll do Andrew. Go ahead, Shelly. Uh, no, I'll defer to the CAO. He's got some background okay. information that's Andrew? coming out of see. So Councillor Rowland, to your question, uh, circulated to the EOC membership this past weekend, which is an agenda item for their meeting tomorrow morning. We have prepared two separate forms. One would actually go into bid documents in terms of expectations that uh, will be required of any contractor bidding on a township project and or appearing on site to complete work. Um, and so it sets out their obligations. And then before they actually physically mobilize, uh, there's a separate sheet that they would fill out that talks about the status of those individual personnel from those external services that are going to be either interacting with our staff and or being in one of our buildings in terms of what they're required to declare in terms of the general health and condition of members of that uh, external team. Um, and uh, working on the premise that the uh, EOC committee tomorrow uh, embraces those two documents they will then become uh, matters to be incorporated into our bid document, as well as site mobilization. It may have been helpful if we had got a copy of them in draft to councillors so they could see so that it, this would have been alleviated. Um, Councillor Rossner. Um, so that uh, Rod, uh, Rod's question was on 8.1.1, is it? That's correct, item A. 811, item A, yeah. Um, my question, I have questions on uh, 813 A and B. Um, We're not there yet. We're just doing the financial one, which is 811. Okay. Council Rolleman. I have a follow up question for the treasurer. Um, it seems to me that this financial update is extremely optimistic. Um, we don't know how many businesses are going to take advantage of not paying their taxes, of deferring their taxes. As a business owner, if I have the choice between borrowing, borrowing money to pay my taxes or not, not pay my taxes at zero interest, why wouldn't I just not pay my taxes for six months or a year or whatever it takes, take that money even and invest it in something else and then pay my taxes when, when the mood fits, you know, suits me. 
I think we have to be a little bit more cautious with this. I think this is basically a status quo report. We have nothing in place to prepare ourselves for when we're going to hit shortfalls. I think we should be looking at some serious cuts to our staffing, cuts to our projects to build a reserve, uh, call it a COVID reserve, so that when we get hit with shortages and deferrals and not being able to make our payments, we have something in the bank so we can we can continue on business. Ms. Dettel. Um, so just uh, further on the um, possible program for the deferral for taxation. That is being considered right now, um, but we are waiting for information from the province to determine how such a program would roll out because we do have some legislation that um, any kind of deferral of tax program needs to go through. Uh, it may be something that actually comes from the region. So that's one of the things we're taking a look at. Um, you know, that's the discussions that we're having with the treasurers on a go forward basis. Uh, it is, uh, it's not meant to be, um, reports not, not meant to be optimistic or pessimistic. The report is meant to be realistic with the information that we have. Uh, there are some items in here where we, council has only approved um, the defer or the, uh, yeah, the deferral of interest for um, two months. Uh, the report actually includes deferral of assume uh, that a deferral of interest might go for an additional two or three months after that. But again, that needs to be a council decision. So we've tried, I, I, the, it's tried to be realistic knowing that the situation's going on. But again, it's changing all the time. And um, there are some other programs that are being in, the information that's coming out from the federal and the provincial pro, um, uh, uh, governments right now. And those programs are specifically geared towards assisting different um, sectors. So it's not just the small businesses, it's also place, it's farms as well as have been individuals. So there's all kinds of programs and some of the uh, information that is available is, is in the appendices here, but I agree that we need to continue to monitor it and to monitor what is going on within our municipality. And then there will be some more information coming up uh, and estimate or may possibly some rec uh, recommendations from staff for council. Okay, um, all right, so we're going to go to Margaret because she hasn't spoken yet, and then we'll go out and Derek. Um, I just wanted to say that, I mean, I can understand what uh, Treasurer Stadal has done here, that we, we none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen. But um, I just have to say that we need to remember that just six years ago, around 20, 2014, 2015, the township was in very serious financial trouble. We've done a very good job at recovering from that but you know we could very easily slip back into a bad place um we are in a very precarious situation right now we're going to have to very closely monitor what happens with that tax payment the installment on may 1st um if we were to make some serious cuts to deal with non-payment of taxes um we can't really go to something like our fire protection because that's that's something that everyone needs and we can't cut there. The same with public works. We're looking after our buildings. We're looking after our roads. We need to maintain our assets. And I think we're just going to have to accept that there will be some hard choices to make here, but we may have to really carefully look at our recreation budget. If we have to cut, cut significant amounts, I think it's gonna to have to come out of recreation. So it's something that we really um, have to start thinking about. Uh, Councillor Rolleman and then Councillor Osner. Uh, yes, I was I was going to say some, something similar to what Margaret was saying. I think we need to go to every department uh, in the township and ask them to provide us the list of things that can be cut, such as projects and potentially staffing, like cutting the payroll by 10% or 20% or whatever number they can come back with and bring it to council the next meeting so we can seriously look at ways that we can be prepared. I don't feel we're, we're taking any steps right now to be prepared for what's coming. Councillor Osner. Um, basically, in response to uh, Ms. Stettel's um, <clears throat> comments on the report, um, I, I just I don't want to be caught in a position where by the time this information comes out to us and recommendations come to us, this pandemic's over and it's a redundant report. I I, I want to be proactive, and and I want to make sure that we're protecting. We're, we're protecting the township and our staff long term, not just short term. CEO McNeely. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
So at uh, 1.30 p.m. today, uh, the Premier, as part of his daily press conference, will be sharing with all Ontarians the province's strategy of a phased and gradual reopening of the economy. Depending upon what is in or how detailed um, the Premier's announcement is, will certainly shed light if I'm starting to look out two months, four months, perhaps even six months in time. And that will allow the township as well as other businesses um, across Ontario to get a better understanding of the roadmap and we'll be able to better plan based on those milestones as to how it will affect, in our case, the delivery or range of programs and services. So to Councillor Rolliman's point, um, we did identify in today's report that we were going based upon the best information that we had available when the agenda was prepared and filed last week. As new information becomes available, such as today's announcement, adjustments to our assumptions then would have to be made accordingly. And whatever the positive or negative would be in respect to the budget would have to be accounted for. And whatever those implications are then would um, then be presented to council. We indicated that there was going to be the need for future reports to council as those key pieces of information became known to us. And um, as we have more information, more detailed information, we can be a little bit more precise in some of our assumptions going forward. So uh, we'll have to see what the Premier announces today. Um, I'm hopeful that it does give us a good roadmap. And then yes, we'll be bringing another report to Council based on the implications coming out of today's um, announcement and what, if any, changes need to be made to our current model. And if I may, um, Councillor Rosner, go ahead. Uh, so, CAO McNeely, um, if if this were, if if this uh, announcement today does not definitively give us an answer, how fast is staff going to come back with this report? Are we going to have a report in days? CAO so, McNeely, Madam Mayor, through to Councillor Ostner, if I could, uh, if I look at what Saskatchewan rolled out uh, last week. It gave me some key information that allowed me to assess thresholds in terms of perhaps being able to use our facilities or parks going forward. As an example, in Saskatchewan, for the first two phases, they only allowed social gathering up to 10 persons. Well, that has a significant limitation during the period of that restriction in terms of what activities could actually then occur within our buildings or in our playgrounds or sports fields. So I'm assuming that the province of Ontario, similar to Saskatchewan, is going to articulate those key benchmarks. And what will be interesting to see is how far out they go. The last three phases, as it related to the five phase program in Saskatchewan, were very vague. It, you know, information to be forthcoming as more testing became available of their residents. But if we have a similar threshold, I'll be able to speak deeper about what it means for our sports leagues this summer, what it may mean to summer ice as it relates to when and if we put ice into the NDCC, because we normally start the end of July to have it available after the Civic weekend, and potentially into the fall season, depending upon how precise um, the government is and their directives going out multiple months. And if we only have it out to, let's say August, then we'll make adjustments to that period. And then we'll flag areas that as more information becomes available, as we get deeper into the summer, where further adjustments uh, would be warranted based on the provincial directives. So as I was gonna say, um... I think we're almost at the peak of, of what's happened in this virus. I think Ms. Dedo's report is probably accurate for the time now. I don't think it's going to get worse. I think we are at the peak and we're ready to go and plummet the curve a bit, which means that we're going to be looking into a more positive situation rather than negative. I would hate for us to make drastic moves now that affect staff only to have to call back them in a week although we do have to be prudent. 
we do have to be cautious and we do have to err on the side of cautious. So it is a balancing act. Councilor Austin. My, my only concern is, and this is what I'm hearing, my, my biggest concern is uh, public perception. Everybody is sacrificing. Everybody is saying, you know, we don't have jobs. And I hear all, all the time, I hear, well, our arenas are closed, our parks are closed, you know, Rose Department doesn't have that much to do, this and that. It, you know, whether they're just opinions, educated or not, they're opinions and they're concerns. And the thing is, it's hard to say when someone says to me, well, if, if the arenas and parks are closed, what's, what's all your rec staff and park, parks and rec staff doing? They can have I, if I could. I think it's important that we, perhaps we, we fill that Just void. Just a minute, then. gentlemen, gentlemen, one at a time. So you're done, Councillor Austin? Yeah, I'm done. CEO McNeely? So, Madam Mayor, I think we need to fill that vacuum because there's a lot of work going on with our outside forces. Beaky Road for two kilometers was rebuilt by Public Works uh, last week. Um, the uh, roadside ditching program on Greenfield between uh, Dumfries and Sprague's is well underway. We need to get that ditching program completed before the new uh, asphalt surface is uh, completed uh, later uh, in June. Um, today, they're also at the Brant Waterloo Road at Reedsville rebuilding that hill and putting in a ditching system so that we don't have the continual erosion of uh, the gravel surface at that road. Those are prime examples of how the forces are being deployed. They're using their social distancing as per the provincial directives. They have on-site um, access to soap and water and, and similar, but they are doing meaningful work as part of uh, their areas of responsibility. With respect to parks and facilities, we're painting the inside of certain buildings that were scheduled for later in the year. We are um, open, getting our parks ready so they can, when the restrictions are lifted, they're ready to be used by the public. Um, so work is going on by all. We have not hired the additional staff that would normally have been part of our complement because that's part of our cost containment strategy. So we are using exclusively our core full-time staff and we have not augmented with the additional hires, which are part of our base budget. Councilor Austin. Um, and and that, that's fine. I mean, this is all information that would have been, you know, useful for us to know, because like when, when somebody asked me in general conversation or in passing or our other conversations or, you know, of, of what's what's going on with staff well then i'm i'm just i'm i'm trying to be as vague as possible but it'd be it'd be it'd be helpful for us <laughs> it'd be helpful for us to have a little bit of information as to how we can respond to this as to knowing what staff is doing because to be honest with you i have no idea what parks and rec staff are doing right now absolutely none councillor roleman You might thank not, you. You, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to just refer back to something that the CAO was talking about, and it's, it's really the elephant in the room. Uh, it's ice usage. You know, we're talking about um, July ice. We're talking about fall ice. I know we have a meeting with our user groups coming up in May. I think to be fair to them, we need to talk to them seriously about going forward. There could be a second wave of this pandemic where we could be stuck with arenas sitting open with ice not being used. I think it's time to maybe say to the user groups in May that we're going to keep the ACC closed for the entire season, not reopen the ACC, just use the NDCC, force them to go on an ice diet just for this year, and then we can reevaluate next spring. I don't want us to be caught with a situation where we have the ACC said they're open, burning all the energy, the NDCC sitting open, and we're into a second wave of pandemic in, in December, um, or maybe the season is delayed, doesn't get started until October. It's tremendous cost for us to have two arenas at a time of such uncertainty to me is not prudent. We should keep the ACC shuttered for the entire season and just have the NDCC. CEO McNeely and then Margaret. Uh, so Madam Mayor, if I could follow up uh, with uh, Councillor Roloman's statements. Yes, that is already in our work plan. Um, so similar to what we did with the summer user groups. So the adult and minor sports leagues, 
I have been in direct consultation with them over the last three or four weeks to talk about what their registrations look like, what um, seasons might be possible based on certain opening dates, whether or not it actually makes sense for them to have a season. If we were to have um, openings, let's say start July 1st, as an example. Um, so the same sort of scenario would occur with our winter user groups. And they're very, very diverse. They would be minor, minor sports organizations, our adult leagues, or, um, or the Centennials. Each has different interests as well as dynamics. The Premier's announcement and that whole issue of, of uh, public gathering and what the acceptable thresholds may be at certain intervals of time will tremendously inform what we may be able to entertain later this summer or into the fall season. Um, not having an advanced sharing of the, pro of the Premier's announcement, I don't know what it's going to say, but it would certainly form a key component. The other aspect would be the issue of, well, some people may wish to participate in winter sports if they're available. They may not necessarily have the disposable dollars or the discretionary dollars to actually participate. So you may find registrations on one or more of those groups may be smaller than in past years as families tighten up their discretionary spending. That then tremendously influences how many teams may be able to be uh, organized and what that may mean into ICE allocation. So all of these pieces are part of discussions. I have not yet had them with the fall winter users. I'll be honest, I've been focusing to date with the sports leagues and the summer camp um, but yes, emphasis will change as we move into May and hopefully with some information coming out of the province to allow those intelligent, informed discussions to occur. Councillor McCreary. I'd like to say that I also share Councillor uh, Rollman's concern about the township running two ice surfaces and the financial impact that has on us and especially at this time. Um, I did ask Treasurer Stadal to provide the information about how much it actually cost the township to keep the ACC open, and it's about $100,000 a year. Most of that cost is related to um, keeping the ice in. If we were to temporarily close the building, we could save a considerable amount of money if it, if it did come to that. We could keep the building open because the space is rented by other user groups, the programming space, is rented by the Air Paris Band and also by the Pipe Band. And we do have a stage there that we could continue to use. But the majority of the savings would come with removing the ice or not putting the ice in. And I just think that um, recreation is a place where we can go to look for efficiencies if it, if it does come to that. And I'm glad to hear with what CAO McNeely says is that the township is currently working with all our user groups and that this, these types of options will be put on the table and that they will be discussed and taken seriously because we don't want to get end up in a precarious financial position. We need to make sure we protect the township's financial position and all taxpayers. If I may see, oh, um, sorry, Ms. Stedall, can you tell me was the 100,000 just for the ICE? So the 100,000, that uh, original information came from um, the budget book, which was an estimate for 2018, and then the numbers for 2019, which are preliminary at this time, are about the same, same 100,000, is the net deficit for the ACC. Now that's after all costs and revenues are associated with it, but there's a number of costs that are in there that even if you close the ACC will still continue, and those are utilities. And there's an issue too with the staffing. The staffing complement um, will still under, um, may still need to be deployed to another area and not necessarily in that particular, uh, in that arena. But there is a, there's a minimum cost for that particular arena if it continues. So is the $100,000 just for the ice or is it uh, $100,000 savings if we did not do the ice but kept the facility. 
No, the sorry, the ice um, that cost is for the ACC for the entire ACC. So it includes the ice as well as the warm side as well. Does it include staffing? Yes, it does. Okay, I was just I was sorry, I was just tossing about the idea of um, not putting the ice in, but allowing the floor to be used for other things. So the net That's saving, if, if the ACC wasn't used I for- I see uh, Councillor Rollerman and then Councillor uh, Cyril McNeely. Pardon, Ms. Dettel? Sorry, if the uh, ice was not put in, there would not be a net savings of 100,000. The savings would be less than that. Oh, that's what I was saying. Councillor Rollerman and then Councillor Cyril McNeely. I just wanted a clarification on what uh, Ms. Dettel just said. So if we close the building, we cannot lay off any staff. She's saying that the staff under some sort of agreement have to be redeployed. I thought I thought we had the ability in this emergency that we could lay off some staff, especially if facilities were closed. CEO McNeely, do you want to respond first? If I could. When we have two ice rinks open, we actually hire seasonal contracts to cover the amount of hours between the two facilities. So if ice were not to be put into the other rink, being the ACC, we would have we would have we would not have the requirement to hire the seasonal contract employees, um, and we would just be able to stay with our core. But council, please, we are getting a little bit ahead of yourself. We don't know what the social distancing and or uh, public gathering thresholds are going to be. We may not even be able to use the warm side of the ACC, depending upon what thresholds the province puts in place. So until we have those pieces of information, we really cannot chart a program. I'm hopeful later today that that information forms part of the premier's announcement. We will look at that information and then we can make adjustments to our business continuity plan. And then both financially as well as other cost containment measures, assess what those implications are. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves on April the 27th to talk about what the fall may look like in the absence of some key information. Councilor Rossner. That, that's, uh, that, that's fine, Andrew. I, I, I agree with all that, but it was over a month ago these questions were raised up when we were told to, to wait until a report came from staff. And, you know, four to six weeks ago, uh, there was even less to do with Parks and Rec and the arenas being closed and everything than there is now. So, you know, four to six weeks ago, we were, we were told to wait for a staff report. Well, then we wait for a staff report. And now we're told to wait till we're like, we're getting ahead of ourselves because now we got to wait till the premier, uh, uh, says something. So, uh, like, I, I again, we just keep hopscotching right through this whole thing. And, uh, you know, the, the public concern and the public perception is that, you know, we're going right through the township hasn't done enough to save and protect itself from potential costs and deficits where taxes will go up next year over it. So, my concern again is that things weren't done four to six weeks ago when they were first brought up because we were told to wait for a staff report for phase one. Then we got the staff report for phase one, then we're told to wait for phase two. And now we're told to wait for the premiere. And, and, and so, so basically what's happening is, is we're hopscotching all the way through it and nothing's going to be done. CEO McNeely. So Madam Mayor, if I could respond to Councillor Osner, I don't think the statement's fair. I don't think it's accurate. The, the attachments in the staff report identify expenditures that are going to be greater than what was budgeted. It shows areas where we're going to have loss of revenues and it identifies areas where we put cost containment measures to date. Based on those elements, we are forecasting a um, a net budget at year end. What I've been saying is, as we get into the latter part of the fall and into the winter season, there could be other changes that are warranted 
based upon what comes out of today's announcement. ICE and indoor facility use come September are two critical elements that will be informed by the province's go forward position in terms of opening up the economy. And depending upon what it says is, there will need to be potentially further adjustments coming out of that. Now, some of our cost containment measures that have been deployed, we identified in the report to you today. ICE was taken out early, savings in terms of utilities. Certain staff were let go from their contracts early, cost containment. Certain staff were not hired that were in the budget to do base work, savings. Those are representative examples along with savings in terms of some utilities because we're not running the ice plants and the like, but there have been measures brought to date based upon the information that we have available. Almost each and every day, there's a new announcement coming out federally or provincially related to COVID. And we need, as we identified in the report, to continually assess what those implications are and make our adjustments accordingly. I have no doubt that there will be significant changes as we talk about the back end of this summer and into the fall season as it relates to elements of our recreation program, including our ice. What that will look like, I don't know, but we will have to make the adjustments. And as an example, if because of the restrictions imposed by the province and or as a result of diminished number of teams through registrations or whatever, we're down to one ice, then we will be identifying there's no need to hire certain seasonal staff, including contract employees, as well as what those utility savings could be and how is that offset by the loss of revenue. I just can't quantify the magnitude to you right now. But that will be, and hopeful, I'm getting more information today from the Premier, there will be another report to Council. We identified that in today's report, that where there's meaningful information, we will make the adjustments going forward. We're comfortable with where we are today based on today's information, but there is more work to be done and it will be presented to Council along with whatever the strategies, whether it be staffing or other, or other cost containment measures to get us as close to zero as possible for year end. Councilor McCreary. Um, I want to uh, thank CAO McNeely for um, clarifying all that, but I just want to say, I, I don't think we are getting ahead of ourselves if we just put these ideas out on the table for a discussion. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, it's important that everyone knows what could possibly happen. It's important that we have transparent, open discussions at the council table. So I just wanted to put the idea out there that closing the ACC temporarily would be something we, we would think about. Not making a decision now, but is something that the public has to realize could could be an eventuality. Could be. It's terrible. We don't know. It's terrible. Just to follow up to CM McNeely's uh, the discussion on the in the report on attachment number one, there's a number of different items, and those are just preliminary items that we've identified. Uh, the staff is continuing to go through more detail of the line by line items, and every time there is a revenue that's that's brought up or an expenditure that is being um, you know signed off on. We're taking a look at all of those things. We're taking a look at the capital budgets more in depth. So, but if counselors, you know, take a look at this and have any questions, or if you have more suggestions, please, by all means, get, let us know because we are trying to do whatever we can to mitigate uh, losses if we can. We wanna make sure that the township continues to remain uh, in, a, in a positive financial um, situation, but we are cognizant of the fact that there are many people and businesses out there that are suffering issue, losses with this pandemic. Um, if I can interject, this has been an excellent discussion. This is what the people want to discuss, the public want to discuss, they want to know more. There is a, a CEO McNeely, myself and Ms. Dettel have an advantage. We're meeting daily in meetings with 
professionals that are telling us how this is happening and things, how are they unrolling? A lot of those meetings are closed and therefore you don't have the information that we do. I'm hoping that instead of us having more council meetings, that we maybe have a, a get together every two weeks and we say, okay, where an update, give us an update on what's happening because you don't get that update. I get it on a daily basis, but um, you as the counselors don't, and maybe we have to communicate better or find a better way of communicating to you. Now, um, the um, meetings from the region the, on, on the pandemic and such, but maybe we need to do more on just what's happening within our township. We need to communicate better to our council so they can better communicate to the public. So Ms. Shettle and, and, and uh, Mr. McNeely, we will discuss this further and see if we can come up with a way of just a, a, a report sent out every two weeks or whether we come together as a council every two weeks on Zoom and publicly and address these issues again and get an update. But we can't do further apart than, than two weeks because too much is happening too quickly. But that's for other discussions. Uh, Councilor Gillespie. I was wondering if the council really should set an example for the residents by taking a 10% wage cut. Maybe that's something that we could look at. Any comments? Ms. Tittle. I can certainly add, you know, items like that, suggestions like that to a list, not necessarily, you know, make it uh, automatic or anything like that, but definitely those are the types of suggestions that would be adding to the list. Councillor Austin. I, I think that would, would be a very small uh, amount compared to um, uh, savings that could, could amount to more by uh, adjusting staffing. I mean, I mean uh, you know, if, if you want to lay off council and not make decisions, then, then fine, do that. And let's not meet. But, you know, for the for the for the small amount that yeah you know like we're not talking huge we're not talking the biggest wages and the biggest costs in the township um, there's a lot of places we could we could do the savings but we need to be able to be working to do those to make those savings I, I have to agree with Councillor Osner that um, it would be purely a, a, a gesture that wouldn't have a lot of impact on the dollar figures of the township and, and it would not make any kind of positive impact to the public. Um, Councillor Gillespie. Well, I realize it's not a lot of money, but it's just, I, I think it would be good optics. And maybe if we took a, a wage cut, the staff could take a wage cut too and save some employees that way. Councillor McCreary. Um, the councillors, we really are not paid very much money. Really, we're just getting a little stipend and no one does this job for the money. We're all putting in far more hours than we're, we're paid for. No one does this job for the money. We do it because we want to help the township. And we always have been that way. Now and in this crisis and before, that's why we ran for office. But I think Ms. Shadow can put it on the list and we can look at it and what kind of impact it will have. And we can decide once we have the information. Is everyone comfortable with that? I see some head nodding. Okay, so uh, Council, oh yeah, thumbs up from Council Rollman. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? Then we can go ahead with the resolution um, on 8.1.1. Uh, Ms. Sage, if you'd like to just read as presented, you don't have to do the whole page. Oh, no, actually, this is an important one. I'm going to ask you to read the whole page. Certainly, yes. Um, so moved by Councillor Ostner, seconded by Councillor McCreary, that report number FIN number 09-2020 be received and that Council amend its purchasing procurement procedures to require A, all contractors or vendors that are providing services which require on-site visitation provide signed COVID-19 vendor questionnaire forms prior to their visit for staff to evaluate if the on-site visit can, can occur. B, all requests for proposals and tender submissions will require vendors to provide their COVID-19 policy and procedures, which will be evaluated by township staff prior to on-site visits. And that the treasurer slash director of corporate services implement procedures as necessary to improve the ability for payments to vendors and, be, and by residents to the township to be completed electronically. And that the treasurer director of corporate services continue to coordinate with the region of Waterloo area treasurers future financial relief programs for taxpayers 
and that the Treasurer Director of Corporate Services provide a further update on the Township's financial status in June. So Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? Yes. Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. That motion is carried. Thank you. And next we're going to go with the Committee of Old Recommendation item be approved as presented and outlined in the staff report regarding the community services function areas on the ice resurfacer now um, and the Zamboni. I believe Councillor Osner, you wanted to speak on this? On the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm switching back and forth here on the, I gotta get back to that one. Uh, we were, I also see Councillor Rollman's hands up. Do you want me to defer to Councillor Rollman until you're ready, um, Councillor Rossi? No, we're at the Zamboni. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, or I'm just getting to the report. Rod, do you want to go ahead? I'll, I just want to get to the to the. Councillor Rollman. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor, uh, Mayor Fox and Councillor Rossner. I just wanted to say that I think at this time, it's not a good idea for us to purchase a Zamboni. I think we should defer this for a year. We don't have the ICE uh, usage report back yet. The ICE needs assessment has not been done yet. We don't even know if we're going to have two arenas. We might. We just got finished discussing maybe potentially closing the ACC for a season. It doesn't make any sense to me right now to be purchasing a Zamboni. CEO McNeely, can we go another season without it? Madam Mayor, the, um, the unit that's being replaced is a 2006 year model. Um, it is beyond its life expectancy. Um, we have incurred the last few years um, additional expense, expenses to keep it in good operating order. Um, there's nothing that I'm aware of that would prevent it from being used this year, we, if it's used. Um, we may incur slightly higher maintenance just because parts are wearing out, hoses are wearing out and the like. Um, but it has been put out of the season in good working order. Councillor Rosner. Yes, um, I, was, I was basically a question, same thing that if we can get by another year, uh, another year on it. Like, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm getting very nervous of the public optics on what we're doing, well, how we're spending money, um, how, how different things, uh, decisions are being made. I just think at this point right now, it might be a smarter decision to wait one more season. If we can get by with the, with the old Zamboni for one more year, uh, that, that might, uh, that might be a, a safer decision right now. Any other comments? So, um, Mayor Foxton, my yes, hand's up. Council McCreary. <laughs> I, I just I want to say I, I agree with what uh, Councillor Osner is saying. This is a very expensive piece of equipment. It is $100,000. And if we can just leave that money um, so it's a bit of a cushion for us, it would be better that we not buy the piece of equipment now. We can defer it for another year. And I think that another thing we need to talk about, we could talk about it other uh, now, or I guess or under the next report, rec report, um, our indoor ice usage study, uh, council approved that that study be done. Um, I think it was back in December, it was CAO report uh, 54, 2019. And I just like to know um, where we stand with getting the request for proposal out on that, because uh, I think now it's a very important time to move forward with that analysis. And we, we do have a grant that's going to pay for a good portion of that. I think we have about a $70,000 or $80,000 grant from the province of Ontario efficiency funding to do that study. CEO McNeely. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, follow up to uh, Councillor McCreary. Um, yes, we were successful in securing um, the equivalent of 70,000, 70, 70,000 uh, from the province under their modernization program to undertake the ICE needs analysis. We actually got the contractual documents last week 
uh, from the province to finalize the terms and conditions associated with that grant. And now that we have the, our, our obligations articulated by the province, we're in a position now to issue the RFP and it will be posted to the open market this week. Because there were certain thresholds and benchmarks that we had to incorporate for uh, the scope of the work to make sure we aligned with the province's uh, obli uh, contractual obligations for the grant. That's now in place. We're ready to go to the marketplace. Thank you. Um, I tend to agree with the other councillors on the motion. So um, I will have Ms. Sage read it and we can vote according, accordingly. Ashley, your mic is not, you are you muted? Sorry, this is, in, this is pertaining to uh, report REC 05-2020? Yes. Correct. And as the staff recommendation, is that the resolution you'd like read? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so moved by Councillor Gillespie and seconded by Councillor Rolleman that council receive rec report number 05-2020 and that the town and that township staff be authorized to issue a purchase order for the supply and delivery of one ice resurfacing machine model 526 from Zamboni purchased through Sourcewell slash LAS, the municipal buying group program in their total bid amount of $98,775.10 plus HST. And that upon delivery of the new ice resurfacing, the existing ice resurfacing at the NDCC Zamboni 526 will be transported at no extra charge to the ACC and the ice resurfacing Zamboni 440 at the Queen Elizabeth Arena, the ACC, be removed off-site as a trade in, in all at no extra charge. And that upon arrival of the new ice resurfacing unit that the existing Zamboni 440 be deemed surplus and traded in against the new unit and that the proceeds from the trade-in estimate at $10,000 to $12,000 be applied to the Recreation Division Rolling Stock Reserve account, and that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute any necessary documents to facilitate the purchase of one new ice resurfacing from Zamboni on behalf of the Township. So Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? No. Uh, Councillor Rollman, how do you vote? Opposed. Uh, Councillor Osner, how do you vote? Opposed. Councillor McCreary? No. And Councillor Gillespie? No. So that motion has been uh, lost. Thank you. And next we are going to talk about the ice allocation. Um, are there any comments from councillors? Councillor Rollman. Uh, thank you. I'm just curious, um, we, we revised this program a few years ago, and I think under previous council, and one of the key issues was uh, sports associations like minor hockey, figure skating, the Sens, turning back ice at the last second, and the township was stuck with a lot of ice that we couldn't sell off to somebody else. We thought, I thought we remedied that by having this ice policy put in place. Now I see that um, Mark Smuck and Sonny want to change our policy that we worked so hard to to draft a few years ago. I'm just curious what, what caused this, uh, this big change. And I haven't heard any comments from, from Mike Tebow or from minor hockey that they had a big problem with the policy as it, as it stood. So I'm just curious what's driving this change and, and is this necessary? If I can interject, I've been contacted by a lot and talking about you plan your season and you hope you make it to your playoffs. And if you don't, you're saddled with this extra ice. And another thing is once you get to playoffs, you don't know if you're going to win or lose your first game, so you don't know how many more games you have, but you're committed to those ice times, and it, it's a substantial cost. So I thought this new policy was pretty darn good in that it took into consideration the hardship that it does cost these people. CEO McNeely. Um, so Madam Mayor, if I could just add to your comment. Yes, the township has received comments, both leading into the revisiting of the policy as well as part of the consultation associated with, with proposed amendments for council's consideration as further amendments to the existing policy. And the biggest issue was the window of time for the turn back. So Councillor Rolleman, you're quite correct. The past term of council did um, early in its term. We only had a window of time where I believe it was like a four days or seven days notice, and then the ice could be turned back. 
and anything outside of whatever that window was, the township effectively ate. And we were incurring potential losses that were double digit. Um, and obviously it affected then the bottom line um, because it was difficult to uh, recover that lost revenue. So council with the policy that's currently in place, amended it such that there had to be 30 days lead time. And if we were not successful in terms of repurposing that ice to another uh, user, then the originating organizer had to pay the township for that um, utilized ice. What we are hearing, and to Madam Mayor's point, the groups, whether they be minor sports organizations or the SENS, um, it's affecting their bottom line. They're having to, to buffer, for lack of a better term, additional costs into their budgets and intense user fees that they charge through registration or sponsorship to try and cover some of those shortfalls in the event that they can't use their full, full uh, allocation. What those user groups wanted was actually that the policy be eliminated or significantly reduced in terms of the notice window. So what staff have proposed uh, for council's consideration is to try and find a spot between what some of the user groups asked for versus what the existing policy currently reads. Most teams do have at least the introduction of um, either uh, play, playoffs under the OMHA or the equivalent under the OWHA uh, program. Um, and if they get knocked out of their first round, they usually go to what they call second, uh, second season. So they're generally, if they don't go very far in one or the other stream, they're generally out around the middle of February. Now with the SENS now migrating to a junior B division, they actually have a longer season. Their season I believe is eight games longer than what has traditionally occurred. And generally their regular season now goes into um, the very early part of February. And obviously if they're successful in getting into the playoffs, they go deeper into February and potentially March. So when we looked at some of those pivot points, we were using February 15th as a new benchmark. And by then teams should know where their ice needs are going to be for a reasonable period of time going forward. And we were trying to use March 1st as the new window of time. So if a team gave us or an organization gave us um, that two week window, that would bring us initially to March 1st. With the understanding now of what kind of ice is gonna be used through the month of March, what it may mean is we start consolidating ice either to the NDCC or we start looking at the closeout of the ACC earlier in the season. What we have found traditionally is somewhere around March break, we see a significant drop of ice. So we actually started this year by taking that ice out early. It was partly driven by COVID, but it was also partly driven by lack of meaningful hours. And with some shifts in programming and reallocation of teams, we were going to consolidate at the NDCC. So Yes, we're proposing a slightly shorter um, window of turn back ice. It would kick in in mid-February, not at the beginning of the year, but partway through the season. And we as a corporation then need to look at the back end of the season and whether we need to close out the ACC earlier and consolidate activity um, at the NDCC. So while we may be reducing the window of turn back, we also need to make some business decisions at, as it relates to the other ice surface. Now, in this conversation, I'm looking at a traditional year. COVID-19 and the 2021 season may be different for other reasons. 
to uh, Councillor McCreary and then Councillor Arsene. Um, um, CEO McNeely has, has mentioned that the, uh, the SEMS, the Junior C team, is evolving or changing into a Junior B team. And that uh, could have some impact on our ice allocation policy. So I'd like to know if, uh, or I'd like um, staff and, and mayor to give council an update on any discussions that they may have had with the SENS Junior B, Junior C team, and how that's going to affect our ice allocation policy and what, what impact it's gonna have, this change is gonna have on the township. CEO, uh, Councilor Osner was next, and then CEO, so Councilor Osner, can I have CEO McNeely respond first? And uh, can Andrew respond to that first, and then I'll talk. Thank you. Andrew? So, um, Madam Mayor, through to Councilor McCreary. So we know that their season's going to be slightly longer in terms of games played, and I believe it's eight additional games. So what that means is four more home games, if I've got my numbers correct that would be played at the NDCC. So that means they'd be going deeper into January and into early February um, with meaningful scheduled games as part of normal league play. Uh, that's a positive for us. The other is uh, through the season, they require an additional half hour of ice for their weekly practices. Today, they have two ice practice slots, one's an hour, one's an hour and a half. So we'll be picking up an additional half hour through the season when they run two practices a week, which would be the majority of the season. So the aspect of the team migrating from junior C to junior B is potentially a positive for the township as a host within our building as it relates to base revenue through the operating season. Obviously, when it gets into playoffs, no one knows how deep they would go, but we also don't know that in the Junior C League. So playoffs at any level are always a question mark in terms of how successful a team will be year in, year out. But certainly through the regular season, there's a net increase in terms of hours to be rented from the township for practice and potentially uh, league play. Councilor Rossner. Yes. Um, so, so I, I wondered when I when I read this report if it was coming up because of the the, the fact that the SENS are going to be uh, junior B and 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 it could need variating um time slots etc however not assuming that it's it's all the ice user groups uh yeah the ice user groups asked that the last time and and as councillor rollerman said we made this decision because we were getting burned every year for ice and then it, and then not only were we getting burned on the turn back for ice we were getting burned with user groups who had booked this ice expecting our staff on township time and money to find a replacement for their ice use, usage, which, which is the, theoretically, it's like when I look at the Air Adult Soccer, uh, Soccer League and the Air Adult uh, Hockey League, Sportsman Hockey League, when they buy the ice, they're responsible for the ice. If they don't show up, they know they're still responsible for the ice. So that was the whole discussion at that time. And one of the ex-presidents of Air Minor Hockey actually said to me that he laughed when he found out that they could turn back ice at any time. He, he couldn't believe that they could do that. And he's like, fine. And they were, they were sitting with over a half a million dollars in the bank, which is kind of hard to take away from taxpayers on top of the break that minor sports get from taxpayers for the ice time. Um, it's hard for them to, to get the double whammy and just lose the money on the ice. So that's why we came up with this policy. Um, if it becomes an issue with the SENS, then I, I think that we can, we can legitimately work with the SENS organization and adapt the ice time to whatever they need. I have no problem with that. 
as for Mayor Air Minor Hockey, I cannot believe when they set their their um, their registration fees at the beginning of the year that that money that gets turned back for the ice time that's not used, well, you know, do does do the registrants get their money back for that? And and that's one thing. And the second thing is that I I don't know any kid that wouldn't want like if, if they're out of the playoffs I don't know any any team of kids that wouldn't want to go out and just have fun for an hour of ice if it's paid for anyway so I, I I have a little bit of a problem with with turning ice back period but we said 30 days is fine I think we should stick with the 30 days and then say under extenuating circumstances like for the sends or whatever we can we'll we'll be more than happy to work with them to accommodate them to make sure that they're successful Okay, so the policy actually says, and I'm on page 11 here under 7.1 return ice temp, um, and it says, uh, the representative designated by the ice user shall give recreation services 30 days notice prior to February 15th and 14 days notice thereafter without financial penalty. I think that's a really reasonable clause. Everything stays the 30 days before February 15th. So Councillor Austin. Uh, and that, that, sorry, that was the second, second part of my long-winded question statement. Um, is this policy that's in here, is that our current policy or is that the new proposed policy? Because I don't see any difference with the turn back ice in this policy. CEO McNeely. So Madam Mayor, if I could clarify, the existing policy, regardless of the calendar month, is today 30 days. What is being proposed for council's consideration is revising that policy. So from the commencement of the year through to February 15th, 30 day turn back window applies. After February 15th, the, the revision would be to reduce the turn back window notice to 14 days. Can I have Councillor Austin? Um, I understand that. That's clear. What I'm asking is this policy that's in the package, is this the new proposed policy or is it a copy of the current policy? CEO McNeely. Uh, Madam Mayor, through to Councillor Austin. It is a consolidation of the revisions of, that would incorporate the revisions that are summarized in the staff report. So what's okay. being presented to Council is a recommendation of adjustments to the ICE allocation for review, consideration, and a decision. So okay. Councilor Osler, the February 14th, 14 day thereafter, without penalty is new. Yeah, so then this is not the original ICE allocation document. So we can't compare what we have now to what, what staff is asking for, because this is already a doctored document. It, CEO McNeely, it would have been high. It would have been helpful if we had highlighted and read the changes. Uh, Councilor McCreary. Um, I, I agree with what Councilor uh, Osner is saying. When we get a, a document like this that has been amended, that we should have a document that's got strike throughs through it. Like this section is struck out and it has been replaced with this. Because I, I was uncomfortable reading the document as well. It, um, it, the report mentioned that there have been other minor changes, but I don't know what those minor changes were some changes to definitions. I don't know what they were. Um, so it, I think a strike through document, draft document would be better for council to review next time. So as I looked at it, the two changes that stick out to me is 7.1 on page 11, that first paragraph. So instead of 30 days all through the year, it is 30 days notice up until February 15th and then 14 days notice thereafter without penalty. I like that. The other one is the third paragraph there, and I was going to ask how this would work. And it said the unused hours will then revert back to the original user for an option to retain the hours for next year's ice season. CEO McNeil, can you explain that paragraph for me, please? It's under 7.1, third one down. Yes, yeah, so we meet with the user groups um, toward the uh, early part of the summer in preparation of their contracts for the next winter, fall winter season. And so let me just use an example. Let's say that uh, Air Minor Hockey 
excuse me, um, has 40 hours of ice allocated to them between the two uh, arenas. We use that as our starting point for the next year's discussions. And that's typically based on practices being at the ACC, games being at the NDCC, as well as the number of teams, both local league and rep that they're going to field. And we use the previous year's time slots as our first point of reference. So that's what we're saying is if ice is turned back in March, when we start the next season, we would be using that ice time slot as part of their initial allocation for discussion purposes. As we get a better understanding of what their next year's ice is going to be in that May, June uh, discussion, those ice slots may move up or down or between the two facilities based on the user group, as well as all other user groups in terms of their ice demands. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle, but we have a, we use it as a point of reference to start the next year's discussions. I understand, thank you. Councillor Austin. So am I to believe then that the Air Sportsman Hockey League can turn back ice time as well? Madam Mayor, if I could, to Councillor Oster, any user group that meets the threshold of that February 15th timeline would be eligible under this recommended program. We have made it so that it's fair and consistent to any ICE user group based on the thresholds in the revised draft document. So uh, just to clarify, Councillor Oster, that means they have 30 days. They have to give 30 day notice from the season till February 15th and 14 days after that. Do you have another same type question or should I go to Councillor Rollman? Just adding, adding on to the, to the same question. Um, when we originally did this, was it not strictly for the minor uh, hockey users in the sense? The original um, document? The policy originally, if I go back to the previous term of council, Yes. It's always spoken about the user groups. It's never differentiated between youth versus adult. It's always been the ICE user. And so all ICE users were migrated to 30 days notice for turn back ICE when, council, when the former council updated the policy in uh, 2015. Councilor Rollerman. Uh, thank you. I was actually going to say something similar to that. I think that um, I would be comfortable with it being February 28th instead of the middle of February. That way, the 14 days would give us to March break. Most hockey is, is finished by March break. And before March break, people are still interested in taking their kids out for, like, as Derek mentioned, for a family skate or, a, you know, a parent and, and daughter, son skate kind of thing. So I think we should go to February 28th. I also agree with Councillor Ostner that private groups like Air Sportsman's League or people renting ice other than minor hockey or the Sens, you know, or, or girls minor hockey should be not be allowed to turn back the ice. I think only turn back ice for the for the um, minor hockey and for the Sens. Councilor Lassen. Um, do we, did we have a separate agreement with figure skating or is that encompassed under the same policy? CEO McNeely. So Madam Mayor, um, figure skating, ringette, adult leagues, minor sports organizations, they all fall under this ice allocation policy. Mm -hmm. All right, I just, for some reason, I thought we had some different agreement with figure skating because I thought we gave them something with ice. I thought we, we made a special agreement with them. So See Madam Mayor, if I could, that has to do with the um, the ticket ice, right? We have a we have a different category in terms of how costs are recovered uh, for ice usage, but that's in the fees and charges bylaw. They're still governed in terms of the turnback window under the ice allocation, okay, so as that's any a... other group would be. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the Councillor Rollerman, are you asking for an amendment and the amendment be number one, that the date uh, be February 28th, at which that we will drop down to the 14 days. And the second one was that um, 
the men's recreational hockey be not included in the policy? Men's recreational or any other uh, private group that's renting the ice. Only, only this will only apply to um, groups such as minor hockey, minor sports, and this and the sense. Can I say that I, I have a problem with that? Because then if I'm a, a private group and I'm doing this, I'll book ice straight through in case we use it and then I'll cancel whenever I want. I'll book every Sunday night at seven o'clock for the year. And then, oh, it's Christmas, we don't want to take it. So we're going to pass this one up. Or we're going to miss this one up. So that's the problem I have with that. Well, Councilor Austin? Awesome. Awesome. Oh. And, and that's, that's why if that happens to us, it'll only happen to us one year because the next year that ice user is not going to get that ice. The next year they're going to be on a nice diet until they prove that they can use the ice. That, that's how you yeah. fix up any, any user group that wants to play the system. You have to be fair to everybody. And, and I understand that. But if someone's gonna come in and use the system, like if, if a user group, like Air, Air Sportsman Hockey, what if they say, I, I want every Sunday from three o'clock to 11 o'clock. And then all of a sudden turn around and say, no, I only want it from seven to 11. You know, then next year, there's no way they're going to get the three to seven ice. Like, sorry, you you did it once. You're not going to do it again. But that yeah. costs us a huge yeah. deficit in the year they do it. Councilor Rollman. I'm sorry. I think you misunderstood me. I meant private groups could not turn back ice at all. Oh, I understand. I mean, oh. only minor hockey and the Sens can turn back ice with the 14-day notice after the 28th. But private groups, Sportsman's League, they can't turn back ice. They have to take it regardless. CEO uh, McNeely. So just so I have clarification, Councillor Rolleman, you're only looking at revising the policy in so far as it relates to minor sports organizations or the SENS. And the date you're saying we should rather than February 14th should be shifted to the 28th of February with the 14 day window for turn back occurring as of the 28th. But this is where I need clarification. You're asking that the current policy of 30 days turn back be applicable to any other user group other than minor sports and or the SENS. I was gonna suggest that or any other group just, just simply can't turn back the ice. What are your thoughts folks, discussions? Councilor Austin. I, I honestly do not believe than any ice group, uh, group, um, I mean, besides minor sports, any ice uh, user group or any field user group or baseball, soccer, whatever it is, unless it's a minor sport, um, I, I can't believe that that they could even turn ice back. Um, you make a contract, you got you have to fulfill your contract, and I because I've been I've been president of the Air Sportsman Hockey League for. I think about six years and I was president of the air adult uh, hockey league for eight years. And I never once even assumed that we, we could turn ice back or would turn ice back. We got a contract, we paid halfway through the year. And then at the end of the year, that was our deal. And we based our, in, our enrollment charge uh, costs on those figures. You're exactly right. When I played hockey and ringette, that's exactly what we did. Our fees up front when we registered covered the whole season of ice. You're absolutely right. So the amendment would read, now, CEO McNeely, is February 28th um, a difficult date or is, is, is it workable? Why was the 15th picked? Uh, Madam Mayor, the reason why staff took the 15th is because that's usually when in this case, the junior B team would be finishing up or has just recently finished up their regular season. Um, and so they would have a better understanding of where they would be in the concept of playoffs or first round playoffs. The other is, um, once again, with respect to minor organizations, and I'm in this case, I'm gonna use the AMHA as my example. They start playoffs usually around the 10th to 15th of January. So once again, they're into their first round of playoffs and or potentially the first round of their second league, a uh, second season league play. 
And once again, by the middle of February, they've got a better understanding of how many teams or what teams are going to be able to go deeper into February or potentially March. So that's why the pivot was identified as the 15th of February. If your question is, does it make it any difficult for staff to deal with February 28th? No, we just need to know if council wishes to change the policy, is there a magical date? And we need that date known because then we obviously want to be consistently articulating that. And what groups would qualify for the reduced uh, turn back window if council wishes to disaggregate between, I'll call it adults and uh, minor uh, sports organizations. Okay, so um, so the 15th basically was a, an end of season type date, but at the 28th, um, Council Willem, you thought was better due to closer to March break and everything else and things were heading that way. Yes. Uh, the difference, so let's say I'm a team and we lose out and we're not making the playoffs. So we end the 15th. But the teams that are going forward may want to pick up our spare ice. So the 28th may not be a problem. So I don't have a problem with amendment of, I don't have a problem with any amendments. They would read February 28th for the uh, 14 day notice. And the other one would be that this would include minor sports groups, the Centennials, any other guys I'm missing anybody here? How would we want to word this? CEO McNeely, suggestion? So if council wishes to disaggregate between who qualifies for the truncated window of turn back ice, I just generically refer to it as the, the uh, local minor sports organizations, because that would include girls hockey, um, the AMHA, as well as figure skating, okay? But I would also then add the, um, the Air Centennials, Okay, because they're See, technically- like, can I interrupt? I don't know what they're going to be called, the Centennials. Can we say the, the Junior B team? They're going to be called the Air Centennials. Oh, okay. Um, and they're playing in the Junior B League. But, but specifically see the Air Centennials, only because they're technically not a minor sports organization in the same purview as the AMHA or the uh, Rockets. So um, if you identify broadly those those are caveats, then anything else, which is a private rental, which would be the men's league, ladies ring at, or other similar things like ice rentals for power skating and whatever, that's a commercial venture. So it's not a minor sports organization, right? All of those things would be governed by the longer 30 day notice if you're not gonna make that change. I think we even wanted to waive the 30 day notice. Councilor Willeman, will you clarify for me, please? So the 30 day notice for the for the private, like for the Air Sportsman's League, like that would just be gone. They can't turn back hockey, they can't turn back ice at all. That's what I was thinking. So they'd be totally responsible for all the ice that they book, period. Unless they're a minor sport or or the sense. Now, now, but we still, if we shut down the arena because of inclement weather. Or, or whatever cause, then that's different and that's taken care of in the policy. Correct, CEO McNeely? Madam Mayor, that's correct. So if there's a power outage or there's an equipment failure, we had to turn, we had to cancel ice earlier this year because we had a breakdown with the Zamboni partway through the, through the business day. We notified those user groups and they were credited for the ice that we could not deliver within the agreed upon time slot. Okay, so Ms. Sage, do you have the amended um, resolution? So I do have uh, an amended resolution drafted. If um, council, if there's some um, any changes, please let me know. But so moved by Councillor McCreary and seconded by Councillor Osner, the council received Rec Report 06-2020, and that council approved the ice allocation amendments April 27, 2020 as amended to change the notice period for the 14 day notice to turn back ice in the attached policy from February 15th to February 28th 
and amend the policy to only allow local minor sports organizations and the air centennials to be allowed to turn back ice. Okay, you can do the roll call now. Okay, if that sounds good. Um, so Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? No. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. Thank you. And next we have the resolution uh, adopt the recommendations that it adopted as presented by the Committee of the Whole in regards to 9.1. And if you want to go ahead with that one. Certainly. So moved by Councillor Osner and seconded by Councillor McCreary that Council adopt the recommendations as adopted and presented by Committee of the Whole dated April 27th, 2020. Mayor Foxen, how do you vote? Yes. Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Sorry, Councillor Osner, that was yes? Yes, sorry. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. And next is the resolution for the April 14th minutes, council minutes. So moved by Councillor Rollum and seconded by Councillor Gillespie that council approve the following minutes. Council meeting minutes dated April 14th, 2020. Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? Yes. Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. Thank you. And now we're at 10.1, which is the Canada Day. Uh, any comments, councillors? Councillor Osner. Um, the resolution, um, sorry, I have to go to a different email now. That last paragraph of the resolution, I was thinking, uh, we can strike that out of the um, out of the resolution because we're not going to be doing anything with the with a joint in the way of a, a localized joint uh, municipality uh, firework because nobody's doing anything. The region has shut it down. The only thing that's going to happen is a, as a, a national, uh, a federal, um, possibly a federal firework show that's going to be broadcast all across Canada. So nothing locally is going to be going on there. So I don't I don't want to assume that we're going to have our staff or anybody work with other local municipalities because I don't I wouldn't really want to put our funds towards doing fireworks somewhere else. If we're not doing fireworks in our town, um, we we'll save the money for next year. Uh, thank you, Councillor Osner. If everyone is in agreement, then I need the mover and the seconder to agree to that amendment, which is the mover is Councillor Gillespie and the seconder is Councillor Rollerman. Do you both agree with the amendment? Yes. The amendment is to drop that last paragraph. Are there any comments or questions further? Then as amended, uh, Ms. Sage, could you please read the resolution? Certainly. So moved by Councillor Gillespie and seconded by Councillor Rollerman that regretfully the Canada Day celebration scheduled for Wednesday, July 1st, 2020 in Schmidt Park be canceled due to the ongoing concerns and issues surrounding the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and that staff provide the appropriate notice to the community in this manner, in this matter, sorry. And uh, Mayor Foxen, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Sorry, Councillor McCreary? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and Councillor Gillespie. Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. Uh, we're at 12.1 uh, in regards to the correspondence. On the Branton Village Land Trust, if uh, on, on page one of that, uh, current members of the board, they're asking for someone to sit on that. Uh, Councillor Gillespie, would you like to find out more information about this and consider being a member of that village trust? Uh, yes, I will uh, check that out for sure. So, um, so we're not going to state right now that she will be on it, but that she is going to look into it and at the next council meeting, let us know. Yes. Okay, thank you. And any comments about the Sengen? 
it is what it is. So, uh, Councilor uh, Ms. Sage, if you'd like to go on and read that. Uh, so moved by Councilor McCreary and seconded by Councilor. Oh, just a minute, just a minute. Councilor Gillespie? This the, which one are we talking about? The uh, internet stuff? The Stengen is with the, it's on the same uh, motion. So, yes. Did you want to say anything about the Stengen? Well, I'm really disappointed that we cannot get any internet. I've had all kinds of people calling me about this. So what is our next step? What What's going on with SWIFT? CEO McNeely, because I'm due to be bound by confidentiality, I'll let you answer. Yes, um, Madam Mayor, if I could, Councillor Gillespie, uh, and uh, I guess this will be of interest to all members of council. About a month ago, give or take a few days, um, the RFPs to the private sector um, as potential uh, internet service providers was released by SWIFT specific for the uh, region of Waterloo geographic area. And effectively, because of the terms and conditions of the program, it's almost exclusively for the four townships. Um, so I apologize, I don't know the closing date of uh, SWIFT's uh, bids to the marketplace, um, but in the next few weeks, they'll receive those bids they will then score and evaluate each of the proposals. And I believe in their work plan, late spring, early summer, they, they hope to be in a position where they can start awarding contracts to um, preferred internet uh, service providers to actually physically start doing in the field work. Um, by the time they negotiate their contracts and crews would mobilize, I believe they're looking at the fall of 2020 and carrying into the early part of 2021. Councilor Gillespie. Well, I just noticed that Woolwich got hooked up with Bell Internet. So how, like, how, how are they getting it? And we just have no... Because we have no jurisdiction, Swift has no jurisdiction over Bell and they can do that, but those people are gonna end up paying a lot higher because we own 51% of SWIFT, whereas they're out and out. So they will not be bound by the savings of the internet. And it will probably happen just as quickly as SWIFT will happen here. CEO McNeely. Um, and then Councillor Madam Gillespie. Mayor, through to Councillor Gillespie, similar to what the township did, I guess almost three and a half years ago related to Branchton. Right. There are opportunities to do one-off agreements uh, where there's a municipal contribution. Um, City of Hamilton has just done the same thing in their rural areas. They've entered into a contract uh, where there's a cost sharing arrangement between um, an ISP provider as, and the municipality. So I don't know the specifics of what was negotiated in Woolwich, but I mean, the township has done that. It was specific to a certain geographic area with certain terms and conditions. I know the city of Hamilton has just done the same thing about two months ago. So um, we have bought into the, the SWIFT program. It'll be interesting to see what projects are awarded specific to North Dumfries, um, as well as the time frame for that. And as I said, we should have a better understanding toward um, the end of spring, early summer, in terms of uh, what new services may be available to some of our underserviced areas. Seeing no other comments, do you want to, uh, Council Osner, did you have your hand up? Um, basically, Andrew said uh, what I was going to mention. I was going to say, hey, Pam, you know, you got Bell out there three and a half years ago. We did this for you. Out, uh, oh, your, your I, board. I You're it. wondering why. <laughs> And how we can, yeah, you know, no, we're we're good. Yeah, it's been answered. And and just to clarify, Councillor Gillespie wasn't in the area that got it. Uh, Councillor Rollman. One one thing we haven't discussed is uh, what about the business parks? I mean, we talked about getting high speed for the business parks. They're still on Bell. They're on Bell lines, and you can't even download. You can barely download. Like I know under Swift, they can download the minimum requirement. But when you run a business in a business park. All my neighbors in both business parks, the 401 and also down on Mellor Drive are telling me, 
they can barely they can barely do any business on their on their um, on their internet. Uh, I have an online store that I that I run, and that thing is is down. It crashes all day long, and it's very frustrating for businesses at this time. We're under a lot of stress, a lot of strain as it is already, and I think we can't just. I mean, it's important for internet for the rural areas, but it's also very important to show you know confidence in our business sector and have some high speed internet available for them down the road as well. CEO McNeely. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just to build on Councillor Rolleman's uh, comments, um, under the criterion that SWIFT is using in terms of eligible areas where uh, new um, infrastructure can be put in, they're using the CRTC minimum requirements of 5010. Um, I believe that was a, a requirement of both the provincial and federal government as it related to the release of their funding contribution to the SWIFT initiative. The 5010 scenario doesn't work very well for businesses that either use video, similar to what we're using, and or um, migrating large volumes of data. And unfortunately, um, the system becomes even more taxed as more and more users adjacent to those businesses tap into the same line. So that's unfortunately a shortcoming of the, uh, the SWIFT initiative. If I focus specifically on the business parks, significant portions of all of our business parks are not eligible for uh, SWIFT programming because of the 5010 threshold um, I do know in the recent past and continuing as we speak right now, certain businesses have upfronted the cost of putting fiber um, and others have been able to tie into those systems or shorten the distance then between the, where the fiber ends and, and to their businesses. But there's a, a significant upfront cost that those businesses have borne to allow um, uh, enhanced uh, connectivity to occur. And, you know, this is something where council may wish to look in the future if we're going to look at some partnership opportunities because the 5010 for most businesses doesn't work. And coming out of COVID, some of the things that we're doing today, like more online purchases, more online financial transactions, video conferencing and the like, may become the norm or businesses will become more reliant on these types of um, higher order services. And uh, today's infrastructure is not sufficient or not adequate on a consistent basis to support the diversity of businesses that are locating in our business parks. Any other comments? The resolution now, please, uh, Ms. Sage. Uh, so moved by Councillor McCreary and seconded by Councillor Osner that the following items be received. Correspondence received from Branchton Village Land Trust regarding the Branchton Village Land Trust News April 2020 and correspondence received from the Centre of Excellence in Next Generation Networks, CENGEN, regarding an update on the CENGEN Community EOI evaluation process for the Rural Ontario Residential Broadband Project Number 1. So Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? Yes. Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. And next we have the Region of Waterloo minutes uh, on March 11th and March 24th and April 1st. Ms. Sage? So uh, moved by Councillor Osner and seconded by Councillor McCreary that the following items be received. Region of Waterloo Council minutes dated March 11th, 2020, March 24th, 2020, and April 1st, 2020. Mayor Hoxton, how do you vote? Yes. Councillor Rollman? Yes. Councillor Osner? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried. And now I believe we're going into closed session. Do you want to read that motion, please? 
Certainly. So moved by Councillor Rolleman and seconded by Councillor Gillespie. That council move into a closed meeting session at 12.44 p.m. under the Municipal Act 2001, Section 239, Subsection 2, Subsection B, and Subsection D to discuss report number CAO 09-2020, Corporate Business Continuity and Staff Resourcing Phase 2, uh, personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local uh, local board employees, Municipal Act Section 239, Subsection 2, Subsection B, and two labor relations or employee negotiations, Municipal Act Section 239, Subsection 2, Subsection D. Mayor Foxton, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rollman? Yes. Uh, Councillor Oster? Yes. Councillor McCreary? Yes. And um, Councillor Gillespie? Yes. Okay, that motion is carried.